Okay, shifting now to the book of Haggai. This is a book dealing with encouragement to rebuild the temple. And why would they need encouragement to rebuild the temple? Well, let me just ask, have you ever had a problem in your life with procrastination and misplaced priorities? Of course you have. We all have. And have you noticed that when there's something you don't want to do, that you keep kicking that can down the road, especially if you know it's the will of God for you to do that thing, your strength in life just seems to be sapped until you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you to face this thing, and you're going you're to take me through. All of a sudden, you have strength to do that task, right? The Lord was waiting for you to be willing. But that's the nation of Israel at this point in history. As we come to the book of Haggai, we come to the last three minor prophets. This is the first of the last three minor prophets that are post-exilic prophets that come after the return from captivity in Babylon. They're now back in the land of Judah, but they've been there from 538 to 520 when Haggai is written. 18 years. They started to rebuild their temple in 536. They laid the foundation. They offered, you know, some sacrifices on the altar, and then nothing for 16 years. Procrastination. Misplaced priorities. That's where the nation of Judah was at. By the time Haggai is raised up as a prophet of God to encourage, you might say at some point, kick him in the rear end, to get their focus back on the Lord and what the Lord wanted. And so he, along with Zechariah, were, were used to point Israel back to God's will in the rebuilding of the temple as the center of worship for these Jews, and thus reestablishing the priority of worship of the Lord as well. So that's what this book is about. And it also teaches us that despite the um, opposition we face because these Jews were facing opposition from the Samaritans. If you read Ezra chapters 4 through 6, um, that is no excuse to still not trust the Lord and do what he wanted done. They need to rebuild that temple. So that's what they were at as a nation. And though this is a book, again, long ago and far away, different culture and everything, I think you're still going to see that there are some applications, big picture-wise, in terms of main spiritual lessons for us in the church age today. Lessons in terms of trusting the Lord, being willing to do His will, and divine enablement, and those sorts of things. So let's begin an overview of this book with the author. Who is the author? He is Haggai, stated right there in chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, that would be 520, Darius came to the throne as the ruler of the Medo-Persian Empire in 522 B.C. So now we are in the sixth month on the first day of the month. You can just make a note there. September 1st by our calendar, 520 B.C. The word of the Lord, there's our formula again, came. It came to Haggai came by Haggai the prophet, and he delivered it to who? To Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And then he goes on. So the author is mentioned here by name, Haggai. In fact, his name occurs nine times in this book, which is astounding for 38 verses. It's a really high percentage, and it, it just keeps emphasizing this is Haggai's book that he's writing. There's hardly ever been any dispute as to whether Haggai really wrote this book. Even liberal critical scholars just concede and say, yeah, he probably wrote it. Now, his name is a derivative from the Hebrew word for festival, Hag. So it could be that his name just means festival or festive. Um, however, there is evidence, too, that it could be related to Haggai is a derived form of a, of a compound word, Hagiyah. It could be an abbreviation of Hagiyah, and 
that Yah ending again speaks of the Lord, Yahweh. So his name could mean festival or it could be a uh, shortened form of festival of Yahweh. And this is speculation again, but some say, well, this could be an indication that he was perhaps born on one of the seven feast days in the Jewish calendar. We don't know. But uh, it's an interesting name. It's a fairly unique name, that's for sure. What else do we know about this man personally? Well, turn with me to the book of Ezra. Back to the historical book of Ezra. Because Ezra provides the historical background and, and framework for our understanding of what's going on in Haggai as well as Zechariah. Turn with me to Ezra chapter 6. Guess who's mentioned here? If you remember from your reading in these historical books, we have a cross-reference to the historical prophet Haggai as well as Zechariah. Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Idu. And they built and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel, etc. Notice they prospered, how? Through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of those two men are the same who wrote their books, Haggai and Zechariah. So Haggai was used of God to encourage the Jews to finish this building project, which they started in five, well, it actually started in 536, laid the foundation, did nothing till 520, 16 years later. They resume it again because of Haggai and Zechariah. They don't finish till 515, about four and a half years later. Look with me at chapter 5 of Ezra. Here's another interesting reference. What does it say here in chapter 5, verse 2? So Zerubbabel, um, is that the right reference? Chapter 5, let's just start with verse 1. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Je Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. Isn't this interesting? What a great role model you have with these two men who were prophesying who were willing to put foot pounds to what they were preaching, who were doers of the word and not merely speakers or hearers in James' language. They not only preached to the people that they should rebuild the temple because this is God's will, but they were willing to put their hand to the work as well and provide a personal example. And this was used of God to accomplish this work. Now what's interesting here, as you note, in Ezra 5, verse 1, as well as Ezra 6, verse 14, who's mentioned first, Haggai or Zechariah? It's Haggai in both instances. He was probably older than Zechariah. And that's why he's mentioned first here, I think, as well as there's a reference in Zechariah when we get to that book where it mentions the young man, Zechariah to himself. So he was probably younger than Haggai. Now we tend to think that if a guy writes a shorter book or he doesn't write as much as another prophet, he wasn't used as much by God. That isn't necessarily true. I think Haggai was probably more the driving force here with the people of Israel in terms of speaking to the leadership and so forth. He wrote a two chapter book but then Zechariah comes along and he writes the longest of the minor prophets, 14 chapters, even a little longer than Hosea, which is 14 chapters. It's kind of like if you think of a New Testament comparison, think of Peter and John. How many books did Peter write? Two. How many did John write? Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Revelation, five books. But in their day, 
who was the leader among leaders? It was Peter, wasn't it? You read the book of Acts and you see that Peter is the one doing the speaking in the first half of Acts, and John is there off to the side, accompanying Peter. And I kind of get the sense as I study the book of Haggai with Zechariah that they had a similar type uh, situation where Haggai was probably the elder spokesman and Zechariah was the one who was used of God as well in speaking to the people, but he wrote a longer book. But Haggai may have been practically, historically more influential at that moment upon the temple being built or rebuilt. Now what about the date for when Haggai was written? We are very fortunate with Haggai that we have very specific dates for when he prophesied, and therefore by deduction, the end point at which he would have written after these prophecies were given. And that would be sometime shortly after 520 BC. Now how do we arrive at that conclusion? Well, we already saw in the opening verse of the book that this prophecy was given in the second year of Darius, so that would be 520, in the sixth month, now keep in mind that's according to the Hebrew calendar, and they started, you know, the first month of Aviv in the spring, or Nisan is another way to say it, with the Passover, and then their calendar basically is about three to four months behind ours. So for them, the sixth month would be the end of August, beginning of September, September 1st, let's say. That's our first marker. Look at chapter 1, verse 15. The people started to work on the 24th day of the sixth month, the same month, just 23 days later. So now we're at September 24th. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Gives us another date. This would be October 21st, the same year. And then we see another reference in verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month, now we're into December by our calendar, December 24th, Christmas Eve, he gives another prophecy. At that time, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying. So these are all four historical references in this book around which the book is structured. And we'll come back to this as we look at the structure for this book. But what this tells us is, as you zoom out for a minute and you look at the big picture again, 520 BC, we are moving not only through the historical books, but now through the prophetic books, and we are inching ever closer to what? We're after the return from captivity in Babylon. Now we're into the post-exilic period marching towards the coming of Messiah. And so these books reference Messiah's coming. Zechariah is going to say a lot about the Messiah. And then there'll be the close with Malachi, who anticipates his coming as well. Now, how long had the Jews left the temple unfinished? And when would it be completed? Well, if you do the chronology, 536 to 520, they had left it unfinished for 16 years. How long would it be until it was finished? Another four and a half years, 515 BC. Big picture again. This book is, a, is being written to a generation after the return from the Babylonian exile. The, dis the temple had been destroyed in 586. Seventy and a half years later, it is finished. In 515 BC, some people say 516. I think probably 515 to be precise. And so that's the time frame that we're looking at here. Now, what else is transpiring at this time? Well, you've got the book of Ezra which records for us what is going on with these prophets of Haggai 
and Zechariah. I'm going to circle them in yellow here. There are these two little dudes down here in our picture. They're encouraging the people, and this parallels what we read about in the book of Ezra. Now, if you remember from reading Ezra, there's two parts to Ezra. There's the early part of Ezra, which describes the return under Zerubbabel of 50,000, the remnant from Babylon. Haggai and Zechariah were part of that. Then you have the latter portion of Ezra, verses, chapters 7 through 10, which deal with another generation, Ezra's generation to be precise. And then much later, 444 BC, you have the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, not the temple, the walls of Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah. Very different book. And then after Nehemiah comes what prophet? Malachi, the very last prophet. Some 80 to 100 years later. Malachi comes about 100 years later. So that's the time frame we're looking at here. We tend to read these Old Testament books and think that all these characters were scrunched together in a very tight time frame. Not necessarily so. God waited another hundred years before he sent Malachi. So again, what is Haggai about? It's about the encouragement to rebuild the temple after it had been destroyed in 586, Solomon's temple. Now they're going to rebuild another temple, but this time a smaller temple, much smaller in fact. So that's the historical situation that we're looking at with Haggai. Who are some significant contemporaries of Haggai? Well, I already mentioned Zechariah the prophet, the one who wrote his book. He actually was prophesying in the month of November, in that tight little window from September through December that Haggai's prophesying. Zechariah jumps in in November, and then he speaks again after that in February or so. So they're speaking in this same approximate time frame. But the other contemporaries of Haggai were the <coughs> governor of Judah named Zerubbabel, as well as the high priest, whose name was Joshua. You're going to read more about those two characters when we get to the book of Zechariah. They're very prominent figures in the book of Zechariah. Joshua would have been the ceremonial leader of the temple system once this temple is rebuilt. And Zerubbabel would have been the civil leader who was a descendant of King David through whom the Messiah would come, actually. You see that a little later on in the book of Haggai. What is the trigger word for this book? The trigger word is rebuild. Let's look at chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. There you have the command. Go get wood and build the temple. God can't be any more direct than that. So that's our trigger word for this book. It centers around the rebuilding of the temple, but not only the rebuilding of the temple, but the encouragement to do so. Look at chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. <clears throat> God says in chapter 2, And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, in Solomon's, that is, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace says the Lord of hosts. He's saying there's coming a day in which the nations are going to come to this place, this puny little temple that you guys are discouraged about building because it's nothing compared to Solomon's temple. I'm, I want to encourage you with what I have in store, plan for a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. So that's the twofold aspect of this book. It's not only about rebuilding the temple, it's about the encouragement from the Lord to do so. The theme of the book of Haggai, therefore, is the priority, the ultimate priority of worshiping God according to his word. 
according to the Mosaic Law and according to the prophets of Haggai and Zechariah. And in Judah's case, for them, the word of the Lord involved or required the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And things would center around the temple in terms of the, their worship in that day. You know, it's funny, we can talk about how important worshiping God is. And oftentimes I hear Christians who sometimes are just very mystical in their understanding of their walk with the Lord. And they talk about, oh, what a great private prayer life and worship life they have. But they never seem to want to get together with the saints and worship corporately funny how that is. And you know, these Jews in their day could talk all they wanted about, oh yes, worship of God's very important to me. Well, then why aren't you rebuilding the temple? So that we can gather corporately and do it together. You see, they really had misplaced priorities. And it's not just about building the temple. It's what that temple represented or stood for that was important. The worship of God. Let's never forget, dear saints, the reason why we were created, the reason why we were saved, the reason why we are still here and not already in heaven. Physically, positionally we are, but why did God leave us here? To worship him and glorify him. He has a purpose in everything that we do that should ultimately glorify him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do what? Do all glory of God. Even the most mundane aspects of your life as you're walking in fellowship with the Lord, doing what you do as unto the Lord, can be an expression of worship. It should be. Because worship isn't just, you know, certain activities like singing and praying. It's all that we do done as unto the Lord that we seek to glorify the Lord in. And so the temple was a means to an end, a greater end. And I say that because, again, sometimes we think this is all about the temple. No, if you think that, you miss the point of Haggai. And we often miss the point in our Christian life as well. Is this a book that mentions Jesus Christ? I think it does. How is he pictured in this book as we think of bigger picture and more important aspects? The law and the prophets point to Jesus Christ and picture him. And Haggai is no exception to that, even though he's only two chapters. He is depicted as the desire of all nations, we already saw in chapter 2, verse 7, as well as him being depicted by the kingly Davidic messianic line through Zerubbabel that's mentioned at the very end of the book. By the way, there's some debate in chapter 2, verse 7 about that translation, desire of all nations. If you've got a Bible translation like mine, the New King James Version, I assume you do, you'll notice that the desire of all nations, those uh, words desire all and nations are capitalized to, to uh, convey that this is a person that is being described here, namely Jesus Christ. And the reason I say there's some debate about this translation is because the Septuagint Greek translation of the Old Testament, as you remember from your bibliology class, that has the translation, the desirable things of all nations shall come. In other words, the wealth of the nations will pour into Jerusalem, and therefore God says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. The wealth comes from the nations. Does that fit contextually? Sure. But I think it's also true that the desire of all nations which is what the Hebrew Masoretic manuscripts say, refers to a person, the one who himself is the desire of all nations. And I put a number of references for you there, cross-referencing to Zechariah. We won't take the time to look at those, but I trust that you will do that in your own private study and encourage you to do that. And I think you will see that the Messiah is going to be in Jerusalem all the nations are going to flock to Jerusalem to see the Messiah. Chapter 14 of Zechariah, verse 16, makes that very clear as well, even though it's not on here. Over and over again. Who do the nations come to see in Jerusalem? The King, Jesus Christ. And by the way, is he the desire of all nations right now? <laughs> 
Hardly. The world does not want to hear about Jesus Christ, though a few do, and they end up getting saved. So again, the present order of what we see on our, on our earth now is going to be reversed when Jesus Christ comes back. What an amazing way to describe the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought of him as the desire of the world? <laughs> it just seems so utterly foreign to the current state of things, doesn't it? And yet, biblically, that will be fulfilled and that will be true. Now, what about the end of the book? Here we have uh, a reference to Zerubbabel. He is the governor of Judah. What does it say about him? Let's read the prophecy in Chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on Christmas Eve, the 24th of December by our calendar, 520. And what was this Christmas Eve message? Speak, verse 21, to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In other words, I'm going to bring down the might of the nations when Christ comes back. Verse 23, in that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. What was a signet ring back then? Remember, they often had uh, wax, soft wax, and they would make an impression upon it, and they would put that wax over a sealed document, and that would be an authoritative sign to the recipient of that document that this came directly from the king because it has his signet right in the hot wax, his seal on there. And so a signet ring was something authoritative, and it represented a king's. Now, what is significant about Zerubbabel? He was a direct descendant of David, and he's in the line of the Messiah. In fact, he's mentioned in Matthew 1, verses 12 and 13, Luke 3, 27, and both the Messianic genealogies of the New Testament. Why? Because through him came Jesus Christ the Messiah. And why would this be significant at this point in 520 B.C.? Well, did they have a monarchy reigning in Israel or Judah at this time? No. They were vassals to the Medo-Persian Empire at that time. That's why Zerubbabel here is a governor. He's not a king, even though he has king's blood in him. I think this is saying indirectly that through you, the messianic promise of a Davidic king is still on the table. Zerubbabel. God will continue your lineage until Messiah comes. That's the implication here. So Christ is depicted through this book, maybe not as explicitly as some other books, but I think he, he is pointed to in this short two-chapter book. What is the basic outline or structure of Haggai? Well, it follows the Four specific dates we've already been given. And since this is such a short book, let's just start reading in chapter 1. <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 1. And by the way, this will count for your, your reading, so you don't have to read this separately outside of class. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. What were people saying at that time? It's not the right time to build the house of the Lord. That was the word of the day. But whose viewpoint was that? That was human viewpoint, wasn't it? Did the Lord ever say that? No. By the way, th 
thinking of leaders like Zerubbabel and Joshua, should they be following what the people think? Well, that wouldn't make them leaders then, would it? Maybe in position, but not practically. A true leader is one who says, you know what, I hear what the people are saying, but that doesn't line up with God's point of view. We're going to follow what God says, even if it crosses the grain of what people want. Because as you heard in your pondering the page again tonight, that God wants you to be a pleaser of him. Not men. Verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Oh, man, you talk about biting sarcasm. In the previous verse, he, said, he quotes the people and says, This is what they're saying. It's not the right time to build the Lord's house. So God sends a message to the prophet, and the first thing he says to the people is, well, is it the right time for you to panel your houses? <laughs> they had nice houses. Back in that day, if you had paneling inside your house in Judah, you had a nice house. And evidently, that's what they were doing. And so they were offering excuses. They had misplaced priorities. That's why he says to them, verse 5, now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Stop and think. He's going to mention consider your ways in verse 7 again. Kind of reminds me of in the New Testament where the Lord says, just stop and think of what I have done for you and how you should respond. to me." Romans 6.11, what does it say? We should reckon what? <laughs> you remember it's a key verse of the Christian life. Therefore, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, the sin nature, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've died with Christ. We've been buried with Christ. We've risen with Christ. We've even ascended with Christ. But we need to reckon, think that we've died with Christ. We've risen with Christ, that passive sense. And why is that important? Because the Christian life centers around our thinking. And I, even in the Old Testament, the Lord wanted them to think and not just go through all the rules and regulations. So he wants to arrest their thinking. Verse 6, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put in a bag with holes. In other words, why are you spinning your wheels? It's because they had misplaced priorities. And so long as they were not recognizing God as preeminent in their life, God says, I can't get behind that. In fact, I must resist that. So all their attempts at physical prosperity were in vain. Verse 8. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Remember, this life is not about us, it's about the Lord. We're here because he created us and put us here for his glorification. He's not here for us. We're here for him. And we get that turned around so easily in our, in our world. Verse 9. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. <laughs> really? The Lord blew away all their prophets so they couldn't get ahead. The Lord stood in the way of their human progress. Yes, why? Because it was all about them. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that it is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house, a <clears throat> paneled house at that. <clears throat> Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. All the labor of your hands. Very interesting. You know, according to the Mosaic Covenant, remember back in Leviticus and um, Deuteronomy, the Lord had said that one of the forms of chastening upon you is that I will withhold the rain and productivity of the land. And so were they being chastened by the Lord? 
Yeah, there's no doubt about it. This was a form of divine discipline that God's blessing was withheld from them due to their disobedience. So what was their response to this message? Let's read verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the, gov- uh, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Remember in the Old Testament, they were told, if you obey, you will be blessed. Well, guess what? Now they're going to obey, and now they will be physically blessed. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. That was a good thing. The fear of the Lord is good, and it is clean, and it is right. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on that 24th day of the sixth month, i.e. September 24th. So within the span of how long? 23 days from the time the message first came to them to when they started the work. Only three weeks basically transpired before the leaders rounded up the troops and the people were in, into the work, doing able to do it as unto the Lord because the Spirit of God was behind them, moving in through their human spirits to see the need to do this. There was conviction from the Lord that led to doing the will of God. So that's chapter 1. What is chapter 2 about? Well, it starts off, verses 1 through 9, with a comparison. A comparison between Solomon's temple and this relatively small temple that they were rebuilding. Now, what effect do you think that would have on the people when they're thinking? you think that would encourage them? Solomon's temple was this massive, beautiful thing. And the rebuilt temple was this much smaller thing by comparison. So God sends his message again. Chapter 2, verse 1. In the seventh month, i.e. October 21st, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, same guy, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest case you were mistaken as to which Zerubbabel and Joshua he's referring to. And to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? In other words, of the people who were in Babylon, who now had returned to the land of Judah, there were still a remnant of that people who remembered what Solomon's temple looked like in its former glory. And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? You know, when we walk by sight instead of by faith, we often miss what God is really seeking to accomplish and what he can accomplish and wants to accomplish and will. We will walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 4 Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Talk about an encouragement. Is this thing little? (laughs) Is this thing not much? Is this nothing in your eyes? Have you ever been asked to do something ministry-wise that you thought was beneath you? You know, there's nothing that's beneath us when we have a servant's heart that's right before the Lord. You know, if you've ever been asked, well, I've gone through Gibbs, and now I'm being asked to teach fifth and sixth grade Sunday school. Pastor often jokes, sometimes people imply, well, how can I 
be part of the inner circle here at the Bible Church. Well, here, here's the toilet bowl scrub brush. You see that inner circle right there? Start scrubbing. You ever heard the expression, little is much, when God is in? There's a song, an old spiritual with that, with those words. Sometimes people mistake, you know, a God being in something if it's big. You know, that church across town is growing numerically. God must be there, not necessarily. There might be some smaller church over here that's faithful, and God is saying, I am with you. But we have a tendency to walk by sight and not by faith. God wants us to walk by faith. If you will be faithful in much, or faithful in little, I will make you faithful in much, the Lord says. The Luke 16.10 principle. You know, I remember years ago, I took a class from Moody Bible Institute, a survey of Christian ministry, and we had to read several books. One was called Success in Ministry. It might not be the exact title, but I'm paraphrasing but as I read this textbook that we were required to read, it was one account after the other of people who had successful ministries out there in evangelicalism. And I started to notice a common thread throughout these successful ministries. They all had big ministries numerically. You know, the definition of success was you have a large church. And I thought, you know what? This book really misses it, even though it's a sign. Bible Institute. What is the Bible's definition of success? Just being willing to trust the Lord and be faithful right where he's planted us, even if it appears small at first, because God has, if God is in it, that is sufficient. I am with you, says the Lord. And you know what? If God is with us in whatever we're doing, that's enough. In fact, it's more than enough. It's all we need. So he is with them. Now going on, it says, verse 6, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in the this place I will give peace, shalom, says the Lord of hosts. So God has great plans for the, the future temple that they may not even see, and did not see at that current time. And again, this is a, an admonition for all of us to not walk by sight, to walk by faith. Verse 10. Now we see part 4. Verses 10 through 19, dealing with contamination. Here is another date given, verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month, i.e. December 24th, Christmas Eve, in the second year of Darius, 520 B.C., the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priests concerning the law, saying, By the way, the priests were supposed to be experts on the law, right? So, here you have the prophet asking the priests. If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, will it become holy? In other words, with that, with that holy meat, if it touches some other food, will that other food become holy because it touches the holy meat? Then the priest answered and said, no. So Haggai flips it around, and he says, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it become unclean? So the priest answered and said, yes, it will become unclean. You see the principle here? That if you've got a rotten apple, let's say you've got a basket of fruit, okay? And you start seeing, you know, fuzz growing on the oranges, and those apples are getting kind of soft to the touch, mushy. So you got fruit in contact with fruit, but you've got a, a, a ripe one in there, an apple that hasn't been corrupted. Will that good apple, the holy apple, 
make the unholy fruit holy? No, it, it works the other way around, doesn't it? Always. That's the principle he's after here. And he's saying, look, guys, in Judah, you've got some bad apples. There's contamination here that you've got to own up to. Because, look, if we're going to build this temple, and this temple is designed to worship the Lord, you take rotten fruit and you put it in that temple, that's not a good thing. You need to be clean yourself if you're going to have this temple. Verse 14, then Haggai answered and said, so is this people and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. And now, carefully consider from, from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw out 50 baths from the press, there were but 20. In other words, there wasn't enough. But this is going to change. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail in the labors of your hands. Remember, God resisted them. Yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. When they were under divine discipline, the Lord wasn't the wind in their sails, so to speak. He was not blessing them. But if they turn to him, they consider their ways. There's a repentance, verse 18. Consider now from this day forward. Remember he said in chapter 1, consider your ways, consider your ways. From the 24th day of the ninth month, Christmas Eve, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. By the way, when the Lord says consider twice, don't you think he's trying to really emphasize that? They're thinking. That's repentance. What are they to consider? Verse 19. Is the seed still in the barn? By December in Judah, no, the seed was not still in the barn. It was out in the field. You know, in that culture, you, you got to understand Israel. What is the rainy season? The rainy season comes in December. Israel. And when it rains there, it rains hard. I've seen videos, haven't been to the land of Israel, I'd love to go there one day, but I've seen videos that when it starts raining, it, come down, it comes down in buckets. And they have the rainy season from December through February or so, where it's raining really hard. So they plant everything before that. As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit, but from this day I will bless you. <clears throat> in other words, because this, you have turned to me now in repentance and faith, I can begin to bless you again. I can be the wind in your sails. Now it is true in the Old Testament. Stop and think about the dispensation they lived in. God had said, if you obey me, I will bless you physically, materially, right? That's what we see here. Is that true in the age of grace? If we obey the Lord, does he promise to physically prosper us? No. Contrary to the word of faith, prosperity preachers, that is not what the New Testament teaches. That's why almost 201, those prosperity preachers are non-dispensational. But let me ask you this, when it comes to the Old Testament, could they sin against the Lord and be spiritually blessed with God being their strength and so forth in the labors that they do? You know? Is that principle true today too, under grace? Can we sin against the Lord and yet be filled with the Spirit for ministry? No, we can't. He can't be the wind in our sails, so to speak, if we're grieving him and so forth. So let's be clear about that. God may choose to bless us despite our sin, but he never blesses us because of our sin. And we live in the age of grace where we know we must be spirit-filled for all the labor we are to do. And boy, when the Lord is behind the labors of our hands, that is a blessing. So let's keep that in mind. That's what he's saying here in this section. And then the book ends, we already read, verses 20 through 23. 
with the coronation of, the future of Zerubbabel, which pictures the coming king, Jesus Christ. You like those four C's I have back there? It helps you remember, right? And when was this prophecy given to Zerubbabel? On the very same day that he had addressed the people. He has a message for the governor as well. So that is the message of the book of Haggai. What are some main spiritual lessons you can learn from this book? Well, number one should be our priority to do God's will above our will. God's will above all else. To do God's will, God's way is defined by God's word through the Old Testament law and these prophets. They were told to rebuild the temple and they were encouraged to do to that end. And keep in mind that when God calls the people to do a certain work, sometimes that involves conviction, it involves correction, but it also involves God's enablement. The Lord says here in this book that I've called you to do something. Don't be discouraged. I am with you. I am with you. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, go into all the world and to preach the gospel and disciple all nations and so forth. And how does the book of Matthew end? Matthew 28, 20. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So that truth is applicable to us as well under grace. We also see from this book that faith sees past present circumstances to what God is doing. And we can't look at just the now and what's right in front of us. We have to look by faith at what God is planning to do because it may extend even into the distant future. And for these Jews, what God had planned regarding a temple went far beyond the small physical temple they were working on to his ultimate plans for the Messiah to come and victory at his second coming. We're going to see in Malachi that the Messiah would come to his temple at the first coming. And each time Christ came to that temple, the glory of the Lord was present at that temple that these these Jews were building right here in Haggai. And of course, he's going to return in glory from heaven one day at his second coming. And so, those are some basic lessons I think we can learn from this short two chapter book. Any questions about Haggai? Haggai? Okay. All right. Let's close in prayer tonight. Jason, you want to lead us in prayer? Father, we just thank you for these studies that we've had tonight, and we just uh, pray for one another that we would just uh, continue to grow in, in a knowledge of your word, and that we would just uh, keep building uh, and developing a deeper relationship with you, Father, and that we would just have that heart's desire to do uh, your will, just according to uh, your way and your word there, Father. And we just pray this for one another, and that we would just continue and, and just to... Uh, Walk by faith and live a life that would please you and glorify you in, in the days that we have here. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.